Uh, Nathan, go get Daddy a water. Amen. Revelation chapter number 19. Got a, a, a thrilling study tonight. Amen. We are coming to the end. I think it'll be the, we got one, one Wednesday night in November, and that'll be chapter number 22. But I may just do it like on a Sunday night or something. I, I don't know. But uh, I'm, I'm just excited about this study and uh, just what the Lord has been doing in our midst and uh, what He's going to continue to do. But uh, Revelation chapter number 19, if you're there, shout amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's go ahead and let's just open up in prayer before we get started. Father, once again, Lord, I just come to you in desperate need of your anointing. I need your help, Lord, to teach this word tonight. Lord, I can't do anything in my own power or ability. I'm nothing without you, God. I need you. I'm helpless unless you come and help me. Use me, Lord, to teach the word. The Holy Spirit is the greatest teacher that there is. And I ask you, Lord, that you would anoint me with your spirit. Anoint me, Lord, with the Holy Ghost to teach, to preach your word. Lord God, I ask you, Lord, that you would touch our minds, help us to hear, help us to understand, and help us to retain what we are hearing tonight. Lord, let it not come in one ear and out the other. Let us not be hearers of the word, but doers. Lord God, I pray against the fowls of the air, every demonic spirit that would try to hinder this teaching from coming forward. Bind it in the name of Jesus from the inside to the outside. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. I ask you, Lord, that you just help me to teach your word. We give you the praise. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Let me take a drink. Amen. I want to thank Sister Diane for washing all my handkerchiefs and rags, too. <laughs> amen. Amen. Revelation 19. Now, tonight, we are entering into... What I believe is the most exciting chapter in all the book of Revelation. We've gone through the seven church ages. You know, remember the seven churches at the beginning of our study a few months ago now? Seven churches represented seven church ages. We are in the last church age right now. The Laodicean church age. And right after the Laodicean church age, Revelation chapter number four... Verse number one takes place. What is that? That's to come up hither and I'll show you the things which must be hereafter. What is that? Come up hither. It is the snatching away, amen, of the saints of the Most High God. God will snatch us, rapture us, catch us away out of this earth to be with the Lord in the air, to be reunited with our, uh, with our loved ones that have gone on to heaven before us and most of all, to be united with Jesus forever and ever. Can you say amen? But we've gone through now the seven church ages in our study. We've covered the seven seal judgments. Who opened up the seals? Jesus did open up those seven seal judgments. That led us into the seven trumpet blasts, seven trumpet judgments. And then after the seven trumpet judgments, there were the seven bowl judgments, B-O-W-L, Marlene, seven bowl judgments, amen. And for the last two weeks, we've covered both uh, spiritual Babylon and great Babylon. Remember, there are two types of Babylon, if you will. You have spiritual Babylon, which is in Revelation chapter number 17. That's talking about the, the condition or the, the world church during the tribulation period under the leadership of the false prophet and the Antichrist. Then you have Revelation chapter number 18, which is talking about Great Babylon. As we learned last week, it is a literal city that will be in existence one, uh, after a couple of things happen. Israel will be a nation when this city is in existence, and it will be in existence after, uh, once the rapture takes place, and then the seven-year tribulation begins. Amen. Babylon exists right now in our day and time. Amen. 
and we covered both spiritual and great Babylon, but now in our study, the great tribulation period is wrapping up. God is wrapping it up now, and he's bringing it to a close. We are just moments away from the conclusion of the tribulation period, and this is what brings us to chapter number 19 tonight. Y'all ready? Amen. Revelation 19 and verse number 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Now, verse number 1 begins by saying, after these things. Well, after what things? After the destruction of both religious Babylon in chapter 17 and great Babylon, the literal city, in chapter number 18. Now immediately after Babylon is judged, John hears a multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, A-L-L-E-L-U-I-A. -L -L -E Hallelujah. It means praise ye the Lord. Amen. After Babylon's fall, all of heaven will break out in a time of praise. Amen. Now why will we begin to praise the Lord in heaven once Babylon falls and once Babylon is judged and her smoke ascends up under the heavens forever and ever? The answer is this. We will praise the Lord for judging evil here upon the earth. Amen. We will praise the Lord because he is a righteous judge. Amen. We'll praise the Lord because he alone is our salvation. He alone is worthy and he alone deserves all the glory, honor, and praise. Can you say amen? Evil will have been judged at this time. The great tribulation period is wrapping up. It is coming to a close. Christ is about to return to this earth with his saints. You and I, the church of the living God, can you say amen? Revelation 19, 2 through 3. For true and righteous are his judgments. That's what we are saying in this beginning verses here. True and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, great Babylon, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servant at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah. And her smoke, Babylon now, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. Amen. Not only will you and I praise the Lord for who he is, but we will praise the Lord for all of his judgments of upon those that are left behind during the tribulation period that chose to worship the image and his mark of the mark of the beast. Amen. The Bible said, for true and righteous are his judgments. Now why are God's judgments true and righteous? Because God's judgment only comes upon a Christ rejecting world. Amen. Hear me tonight. God's judgment only upon those who have rejected Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Why is God going to allow this terrible seven years of, of awful judgment to come upon this earth after the rapture of the church? It is because this world will have rejected Jesus Christ and because they rejected uh, because they rejected God's son Jesus, they have rejected God. Can you say amen? Well, you see, it is through God's son Jesus Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the Son of God. Amen. It is through the Son that we have a way of escape from the eternal judgment and punishment of Almighty God. But when you reject, when you push aside Jesus, you push away the only means of escape you have from the judgment of Almighty God. John 3 and 36 says it. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting Alive, but he that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath 
the judgment, the punishment of God abideth on him. Amen. God's judgments are true and they are righteous. Amen. God isn't going to judge a just person on accident during the tribulation period. God's judgments are true and they are righteous. Can you say amen? Well, Miranda and I, we were watching a documentary about a family in the 1980s. We, I've been reading a lot about this incident that happened, but during the 1980s, there was a, a wicked, wicked man. Uh, the district attorney, his name was Ed Jagles. Anybody remember him? He indicted, I believe it was at least 26 different families over a false allegation. He said that they were all in a satanic ritual. They were all worshiping the devil doing the cultic practices. He said that these parents got their children, molested them in the most evil and wicked way you can even imagine. These people's reputations were ruined. Their lives were forever shattered. Many of them spent years and years in prison. Their whole life came to nothing. Oh, but I'll tell you what, everything came out later on that absolutely none of the people did anything wrong. But the devil had been done to their homes, their marriages, their families, and their reputation. Oh, but I'm telling you, whenever Christ judges this earth, there won't be any unrighteous judgments. Amen. There won't be any wicked judge. He'll be Christ that judges this earth. He will reign and rule this earth forever and ever and ever. Can you say amen tonight? God's judgments are true and righteous, both spiritual and commercial Babylon will be judged for her sin and her rejection of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Revelation 19, 4. And the four and twenty elders, what's that? Twenty-four. All right, all right. I'm going to be giving y'all a quiz in a few weeks as well. It's going to have a prize for this test I'm going to give, but it'd be twenty-four. All right. And the four and twenty elders, twenty-four, and the four beasts, Seraphim angels, remember we learned that in an earlier study. I think it's either Revelation 4, I think 4 or 5, you read about it. But And the four beasts, the seraphim angels, fell down and they worshiped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. Once again, Amen. Well, at this point, John sees the 24 elders and the four seraphim angels fall to their knees as they worship the God that sits upon the throne. Jesus Christ. Take a say, Amen. There's no doubt. It's a picture of what you and I will be doing in heaven just before we return with Jesus Christ on white horses. Amen. We will fall down on our knees saying hallelujah that word means faithful and true amen how many of you know that God is faithful and God is true can you say amen tonight oh you see once again you and I will praise the Lord not just for what he's done for us, not for just saving our soul washing our sins away not for just rapturing us out of this world but we will praise and worship God for who he is he is the almighty God worthy of all the praise, worthy of all the glory, worthy of all the honor. Come on, church, lift up your hands tonight. He is worthy of all the praise, glory, and honor, all of our adoration. We exalt you, Lord. He gets it all. Can you say amen tonight? We'll praise the Lord because he's true. We'll praise the Lord because he's faithful. And because of that, we will shout hallelujah. Say amen. amen. Revelation 19, 5. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his saints, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Amen. Hallelujah. As the elders and the angels bow down in worship, as we are worshiping God together. Amen. Oh, an angel from the throne of God gives a command. He said, praise our God, all ye his servants. How many know that's what God called us to be? Servants. Amen. We are servants and we need to serve God. We need to serve one another. Can you say amen? Praise our God, all ye his servants. 
recompense. Amen. And ye that fear him, both small and great. Amen. As I was studying this uh, Bible study here, I came across that word small. And Thayer's definition said that small means small in size, small in stature, or small in length. Amen. I'm not the tallest individual. I don't know if I'll fall under that small category. Amen. Well, Charlie's kind of tall. He'll be in the, I'll be small. He'll be great. Amen. Oh, but I tell you what it really means. It means from the youngest to the eldest. Amen. You think children are going to be in heaven? You better mark it down. They're going to be in heaven. Amen. How do we know that? Jesus said in Matthew 19, 40, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me. For such is the kingdom of heaven. Can you say amen? Heaven is filled with both the small and the great, the young and the old. And one day you and I will all praise the Lord together. Can you say amen? Revelation 19, 6, and I heard, as it were, remember, given a description now, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, maybe like an ocean, you'd say, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, powerful sounds, saying, hallelujah, once again, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah. When John heard all of heaven praising God, he said that it sounded like a voice of many waters. Amen. All these voices in heaven were so clear and so strong that they sounded like thunder. Amen. The Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people. Amen. Up in heaven, there's no longer any feeble voices. Amen. Up in heaven, there's no longer any voices that are just so, oh, so just uh, soft, if you will, so feeble and so weak. But up in heaven, every voice is strong with the praises of God. Can you say amen? And one day, our voices will all join in on this song, singing hallelujah. Remember, that means praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Amen. What's the word omnipotent mean? It means all ruling. Amen. The Lord God omnipotent, the all ruling God, he reigns forever and ever. We will be singing about how this entire time when we lived on this earth, God was in control during the tribulation period when it looked like Satan was having a field day. God was still in total and complete control. Amen. We will be able to say, whenever I was sick in body, God was still omnipotent. What's that mean? God was still in control. Can you say amen? Whenever I didn't understand the storm of what I was walking through, God was still omnipotent. He was all ruling. Can you say amen? God is all ruling. He's still in complete control. And we don't come to wait till we get to heaven to thank God for him being in control. He's in control right here, right now. It doesn't matter how hard your situation is, how difficult it is, God, how bleak the situation looks, how dark and gloomy it looks. God is still in control. Let us lift up our hand and say the Lord God omnipotent reign in. I'm going to praise God because he is all The Lord omnipotent reigneth. He's all ruling. Amen. All ruling. Praise the Lord. 197. Let us be glad. This is still part of our song that we're singing. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife hath made herself ready. Praise the Lord. John said, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife had made herself ready. Here we have a beautiful event taking place in heaven. The marriage of Christ and his bride. Who's the bride? The church. 
You and I, can you say that? Because the church has been washed in the blood of Jesus, she is now pure, she is now clean, she is now holy, and thus she is qualified to marry Jesus. Can you say amen? Think we can be married to the Lamb in our sin? Oh, you're sadly mistaken. We've got to be washed in the blood. Can you say amen? Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and he keeps me clean. Glory, glory to his name. You and I are that bride in which he is coming back for. Can you say amen? Paul said, the apostle Paul told it in Ephesians 5 and 25, he said, husbands, love your wives. Women say amen. Amen. Husbands, love your wives. Amen. How are we to love our wife? Even as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for that church. Can you say amen? Or right now you and I, we are engaged with Christ, if you will. We're engaged with Christ. We're the, we're the, the bride waiting for the groom to come. Oh, but I'm telling you, one of these days, whenever that trumpet of God sound, oh, we're the, the judgment seat of Christ will take prayer. We will praise the Lord. We'll worship the Lord. We'll do all kinds of different things in heaven during this tribulation period. But there will come a time when the wedding of the bride united with the groom. That's why we sing that song. What is it? We shall see the king when he comes. Amen. Oh, Christ is coming back. Not for a whore. Not for a bride that has polluted herself with the things of this world. But God is coming back for a, a pure church. A spotless church. Without spot and without wrinkle. It's what God said. Amen. Oh, I want to see the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to look upon his face. I want to see those nail pierced hands. Amen. How about you tonight? Are you looking forward to that day? Whenever you'll see God in all of his fullness, in all of his glory, it will take place once the rapture happens. Amen. <clears throat> you remember the time, the day that you got married? Hey, I remember when Daniel and Christina got married. <laughs> Christina bawling her eyes out. <laughs> Randy, you remember the day you guys got married? Amen. Sister Shawna, you remember you and Tom got married? It was a Wednesday. It was a Wednesday. Amen. Oh, how many of you remember the day you, you got married? Amen. Charlie, you remember the day you and Joyce got married? It was a beautiful day, wasn't it? Amen. Wonderful day. And, uh, I remember the day whenever Sister Miranda and I got married. It was a joyous event. It was a time of fulfillment, a time of celebration. It was a time of two before God being made one. Amen. One day Christ will marry his bride, the church, and we'll become one with him forever united. With our God. Can you say that? Revelation 19, 8 through 10. And to her was granted the church, the bride. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Not the righteousness of God here. The righteousness of the saints. Amen. Why are good works important for a Christian? Because one day these good works that we perform are going to be kind of decorating our wedding garment, if you will. Amen. How many know there's cheap wedding garments? Huh? Then there's real expensive wedding garments. Amen. How pretty is that garment you're going to have? Amen. Oh, what are we doing for Christ? Amen. The only thing that will matter once we die is what we did for God. Amen. That's the only thing that will matter. What did we do for God? Amen. Oh, I'm telling you, I don't have a lot of money. Amen. Oh, I don't have thousands of dollars. Sometimes I don't have, most of the time I don't have hundreds of dollars. Most of the time I don't have $50 to my name. Amen. Oh, but I'm telling you, one thing that I do have, I'm doing everything that I can for God. Amen. And Lord, help you and I. Help me, help pastor to do more. Because one day we will 
filthy robe with the righteousness of the saints. Verse number nine. And he saith unto me, right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. Hear that? These are the true sayings of God. Now look at, look at 10. And I, John, I fell at his feet to worship him. Worship the angel now. And he, the angel, said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that has the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Amen. Say that. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Immediately after John sees the glorious wedding of the bride, the church united with Christ, John, John sees the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the angel says that these, these are these sayings of God are true. In other words, they will happen, John. There is no changing it. The bride, the church, will be united with the groom. And whenever John heard that, he immediately made a big mistake. John said in verse number 10, I fell at the angel's feet to worship him. But the angel said, get up. I'm just like you, John. All I am is a messenger. Amen. You are to worship God and you're to worship God alone. Amen. You and I, we are not to worship one another. Amen. I'm not to worship you. You're not to worship me. We're not to worship any other pastor, any other preacher, any other prophet, any other evangelist, any other teacher, any other man or woman of God. We are not to worship them. We are to worship God and God alone. Can you say amen? This, this little scripture right here also proves us to the fact that the Bible wasn't just written by men, if you will. It was written by God. Well, what do you mean? Didn't a man write it? Well, John wrote it down. But if John was making all this up, do you think John would have admitted his own failure here? You think John would have said, oh, I saw that angel and I, I just, uh, I agreed with him. You know, that, that's what I would say, you know. How many know we don't like pointing out our own faults, huh? But the Holy Spirit said unto John, you write down how wrong you were. Amen. In other words, let my bride that's going to read this one day, let them know. Amen. Let them know just to worship God. Amen. Don't worship the preacher. Don't worship the church. Don't worship a denomination. Don't worship this or that. Don't worship idols. You worship God. Can you say amen? Then it says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The angel now explains to John that prophet that the prophecy John was being given was to give us a picture of Jesus Christ. Christ is the reason for all prophecy. Christ must be the focal point of everything that we do. Can you say that? Revelation 19 and verse number 11. And I saw heaven opened. Uh-oh. Praise the Lord. And I saw heaven opened. And behold a white horse he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge. And he maketh war. He makes war. After the marriage of the Lamb, John saw heaven opened up. And he saw someone sitting on a white horse. Why was heaven opened up? Because someone on a white horse was exiting the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Amen. Who was this one that was exiting heaven? Let's look at the descriptions. John said, he that sat upon it, sat upon the white horse, was called faithful and true. Amen. In verse number four tonight, you and I, the saints, in heaven we sang a song calling Jesus the amen. Amen, meaning faithful and true. And then John said, in righteousness he doth judge. This rider on the white horse. Speaking of Jesus, Revelation 19, 2 says, for, for true and righteous are his judgments. Amen. And then it says, for he doth judge 
and make war. Christ is not coming back to this earth to die on a cross again. He's not coming back to be beat, whipped, mocked, spit on, have his beard plucked out, but he is coming back to judge this world, judge this earth. Can you say amen? The descriptions of this rider on the white horse are continued in verse number 12. Then his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. John said that this rider on the white horse had eyes that were as a flame of fire. Amen. These eyes that, that this rider has can see all things. They can see the, the very thoughts, the intents of the heart. They can see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen. Can't hide nothing from God. Speaking of Jesus, Revelation 1.14 said that his eyes were as a flame of fire. Amen. In other words, God's descriptions are not changing. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And on his head were many crowns. Amen. Why are there many crowns on this rider of the white horse's head? Because whenever Jesus comes back to rule this earth, he's not just coming back to rule over Jerusalem. He's not just coming back to rule over Israel. He is coming back to rule over the entirety of this world. Can you say amen? Oh, he's got a crown with many uh, crowns upon his head. Can you say Amen. What gives Christ the right to reign this world that way? Well, because Christ is the one that created this world. Can you say amen? Well, John 1 and 3 says it. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Can you say amen? The descriptions of this writer continue on to verse number 13. And he was clothed with a vesture of garment dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. In case you haven't got who this rider on the white horse is, exit in heaven in Revelation 19. It is the one that loved you. It's the one that loved me. It's the one that came himself for me. It's the one that's been with me. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Amen. Can you lift your hands up unto the Lord? Oh, His name is the Word of God, Jesus Christ. John said, He was clothed with a vesture, a robe, if you will, a garment. That garment that Jesus was wearing was dipped in blood. Why is Jesus coming back with a garment that's been dipped in blood? Because whenever Christ comes the second time, he's not coming as the lamb. He's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming to tread down every enemy. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. He's coming down to tread down his enemies. The enemies of Israel. The enemies of God. The prophet Isaiah spoke of this day 700 years before, minimal 700 years, probably eight, 900 years really before John was ever given this revelation of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 63, verses 2 through 4. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat, wine press, if you will? I have trodden the wine press alone prophecy speaking about the second coming of Jesus. The rider on the white horse wearing a garment has been dipped in blood. Isaiah said verse number 3 of chapter 63. I have trod on the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my rain. Verse number four, for the day of vengeance 
is in my heart that the year of my redeemed is come. Amen. The first time that Christ came, he came as a Savior. But the next time he comes, he's coming to conquer his enemies. Can you say amen? His name is called the Word of God. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. Amen. This writer is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Can you say amen? Revelation 19, 14. And the armies which were in heaven talking about us now. Say, he's talking about me tonight. Amen. Come on, say, he's talking about me. Amen. Talking about me tonight. Oh, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. And they're clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Amen. Who is the army that is following Jesus on white horses? It's you and I. His bride who has just been married to Christ. Can you say Amen. The last time you and I were mentioned in the book of Revelation, besides the times when we're in heaven, heaven praising the Lord, but the last time you and I were mentioned, the church was mentioned here upon the earth, was after the Laodicean church age ended. And Revelation 4, 1 happened, come up hither, and I'll show you the things which will be hereafter. But now, we, we've gone missing, if you will. You cannot find the church here on earth during the entire book after Revelation chapter number 4, verse number 1. Can't find us here on the earth. Why? Because we're in heaven with the Lord. Amen. Amen. But at the second coming. See, the second coming is not the rapture. Y'all understand? There's two different events. The rapture is first. You and I rapture out of here. The second coming, you and I come back with Jesus here to this earth. Can you say, amen? Oh, but whenever we come back, we'll be riding on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. This represents our purity and the righteousness of God that came to us whenever we accepted Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, before I accepted Jesus, I had some dirty garments, if you will. I had a life that was stained with guilt. I had a life that was stained with sin. But whenever I asked Jesus to come into my heart and to wash my sins away, oh, Jesus gave me a robe of righteousness, if you will. No longer does God look at me and all of my sin and all of my failures and in all of my mishaps and mistakes. But when God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of his son Jesus clothing me from head to toe. One of these days, church, we're going to come back on white horses wearing garments that are white and clean. Can you say that? Revelation 19, 15. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. John said that whenever Christ returned, Whenever he saw Christ return in this revelation, that a sharp sword came out of Jesus' mouth. What is this sharp sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth? It's the Word of God. Only God's Word can smite the hearts of men and women. Can you say amen? This is exactly what happened whenever the officers and the Pharisees came to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. In John 18, verse number 6, it says that and when after Jesus said unto them, I am he, Jesus' enemies all went backward and they fell to the ground. Why? Because of the word that came out of the mouth of Jesus. Amen. He is that word. Can you say that? Hebrews 4 verse number 12 said, For the word of God it is quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. I'll tell you, it doesn't matter what you're facing in this life. What you need to do is use the sword of the Spirit. The word of God, amen. It is quicker, it's more powerful, it's more sharper than any two-edged sword, amen. And whenever Jesus Christ returns to this earth with you and I following behind him, his word alone will smite every single one of his enemies, amen. You and I won't have to help God defeat his enemy. We will just look in awe at our husband, if you will, our Lord and Savior. We will look upon him as he smites his enemies and as he smites the enemies of Israel. Can you say amen? I'm glad that I don't have to do the fight. Amen. God is going to do the fight. Too. Why? Because he still fights my battles. Amen. I said he still fights my battle. He said the fight is he yours it's mine. Hallelujah. And whenever we return with Christ, we're not fighting. Christ will destroy his enemies with the word of his mouth. 
glad I'm on the winning side. Amen. You glad you're on the winning side. Amen. Revelation 19, 16 won't be too much longer. And he hath on his vesture, on his garment, and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Let's just lift up our hands to the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to Jesus, glory to Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, yes, he has on his vesture, on his, on his thigh name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This world won't be able to deny who this rider on the white horse is that is coming to smite Israel's enemy. They will look upon Jesus and they will have to say, that is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can you imagine what it's going to be like, sure, as all the enemies of Israel are gathered around her to completely snuff her out of existence, if you will, to completely destroy her, oh, to do what Herod could not do, to do what uh, old Adolf Hitler could not do. Oh, as the world is trying to annihilate them, all of a sudden, I can imagine CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, everything from the real news to the fake news, everybody's going to be filming. All of a sudden, they're going to be saying, Israel looks like it's about to be done with. They're about to be destroyed. But all Seventeen through eighteen, and I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, to "All the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together." What the fowls? What's the fowls of heaven? The birds, if you will, saying, "Come and gather yourselves together under the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings." And the flesh of captains, captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, sit on the horses, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. I'll tell you, we see here the results of God. We see, we see here the results after God treads his enemies in the wine press, if you will, at the Battle of Armageddon. After the battle of Armageddon, an angel cries out with a loud voice, gathers all the birds in the air to come and to eat up the carcasses of who? Even the kings? Riders on the horses? Rich, poor, free, slaves, small, Great everyone that refused Christ will be judged by Christ. Amen. <coughs> the angel calls the birds to eat up the flesh of the kings, the captains, the mighty men, the horses, the soldiers, the bond, and the free. Right here is the I'll tell you, you can't fight against God and win. Amen. You cannot fight against God and win. Revelation 19, 19 through 20. I told you I wouldn't be too much longer. All right. And I saw the beast, the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth, those aligned themselves with the Antichrist, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. <laughs> Oh, how foolish. And I saw the beasts and the kings there, their armies, gathered together to make war against him, to sell on the horse and against his army, 
Yes, does. And the beast was taken, and that Christ was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought, wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. Didn't receive, deceive everybody, only those that took that mark. And to them that worship his image. These both, the Antichrist and the false prophet, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Right up to the very end here of the tribulation period, we see that the Antichrist and the false prophet try their best to rebel and to fight against God. But their efforts, they will come to no avail. Jesus will personally take both the Antichrist and the false prophet and cast them both into the lake of fire. Psalm 2, 1 through 12 speaks of this. I want you to turn your Bibles over to the book of Psalms real quick, okay? And I need to hold my notes. <laughs> Psalm chapter number 2, all right? Psalm chapter number 2, starting in verse number 1. Now this is speaking prophetically regarding the return of Jesus. All right, once again, we're almost done. Psalm 2, 1 through 12. Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagine the main thing. The kings of the earth set themselves. And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. And against his anointed, saying... Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Verse number four, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. In other words, what's God's response to the Antichrist and the false prophet? God just laughs at them. The Lord shall have them in derision. Verse number five, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Verse number six, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said, said, said unto me, Thou art my son. God the Father said, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen, those that are around during the tribulation period, the Antichrist, the false prophet, all those that were left behind that chose to worship the beast in his image. Ask of me and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, be in